Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Quality Chat Block. Hi, Nico, how are you doing? Hello, Jacob. I'm fine. As usual, I am sitting in uh, sunny Glasgow, and you are in the dreadful Thessaloniki. Yes, in the cloudy Thessaloniki, really bad weather today. Yes, I feel for you. <laughs> okay, so uh, today, um, I thought we, we, we'd be quite snappy about it, but I, I had a few things, and they're more, mainly like what I've been following in chess the last week, and uh, I hope it will be entertaining at least. And then maybe you can add on something serious in the end. I'm relying on you here. Okay, of course. You can always rely on me. I know I can. Um, so I've been looking at juniors. Uh, the, the last week, and uh, just before anybody uh, report me to the police, I've been looking at their games with the, the interest of uh, who are the strong chess players of the future. And uh, obviously, I'm very, uh, very much interested in what's happening in Scotland and in Denmark. So we can start with Scotland. Uh, nothing to report of great significance, so we'll move to Denmark. Um, there was a 17-year-old Danish boy who made his first GM norm. It was also his last iron norm, but he made that three rounds earlier, and uh, he took silver medal in the Nordic Championships. Uh, he won three games and drew six. He um, made draws with a, with a number of grandmasters, including Jung Ludwig Hammer. And, uh, and I had one game uh, here that I wanted to show very quickly. Uh, do, are you ready? Yes, yes. So if we move a few moves in. So uh, Martin is white against the uh, opponent from Finland, and uh, there will be uh, a PGN file available on our website with, uh, with the materials from both this week, future weeks, and uh, last week's blog. Uh, so the Scotch Stonewall. No, Dutch Stonewall. It should be a Scotch Stonewall, shouldn't it? <laughs> it's a Dutch Stonewall. And uh, my general opinion of this position is when the knight is on F3, I think black should be theoretically okay. Uh, actually, a very long time ago, I wrote a book on this, mm -hmm. and uh, I did an update uh, that my English publisher didn't want, but we published it ourselves in German maybe 10 years ago. And uh, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting book, I think. Um, I noticed that when there was a book from Gambit on the Stonewall a few years ago, that most of the the interesting uh, places he just quoted my book, a directly interesting place. So I, I don't think much has happened. Uh, so it's, well, okay, in general, I think this position is fine for black. And um, we can just quickly go uh, through the game if you just go like a move a second or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we get some position where White spends a lot of time exchanging the dark square bishops. And uh, Black could have reacted differently, but even as he reacted in the game, he was fine. Uh, I think this is the, the thing with uh, the White player in this game. He's not, uh, yeah, this is a variation, Nikos, if you could. Stick to the main game. This is a oh. variation of, of how I recommended playing Stormwall. As far as I remember, I did not check. But if we have the main game here, a black develops naturally. White exchanges the bishops. Again, this is variation. Sorry. So, um, and uh, we see here that from the opening, basically not much has happened. In theory, uh, black has a bad bishop and white a good bishop. That's a novelty, d6, c4. White has a, a good bishop on g2, black a bad bishop. Well, it's not really clear that's the way it is, and that's one of the points of the opening uh, from black's perspective. But I, I think essentially here, black is equalized, and he could play it in many different ways, and the way he played was fine. Um, so when I was going through the game, I was all the time uh, trying to find out when does it, does it go wrong for black. And it's actually quite late. Uh, he forces the queens off. The position is fine. 
and we have a few more VAM. I'm not wasn't sure about E5, but it, it, it works out fine as well for black F4. And it's interesting to see now that technically uh, it's not clear which bishop is the bad bishop anymore. And this invasion is um, overrated. It's not really doing anything. There's no weaknesses to attack. Here, a5 would have been, been quite nice to uh, include. We can just show that variation, a5. And the point of it is just that uh, this variation, a3, rook a3, and then uh, black wins the pawn and has a better position uh -huh. with simple tactics. Okay, you need to learn this kind of stuff if you want to be an IM. Because... OK. So bishop h5. Um... Yeah, why plays f3, g4? Uh, obviously, the bishop on e6 doesn't become bad uh, because it's on the other side of the, the pawn. Uh, but it is limited in scope still. So the position around here, you could be deceived to think that, that uh, White's doing very well. He's got a pass pawn, his bishop is intrusive, stuff like that. I just think it's an illusion. Um, the knight doesn't have any good squares. The pawn on b6 might be just as much a liability as a strength. And I think Martin's strength, I, I don't know him very well. I've, uh, I've only spoken to him once. We played a few blitz games. Um, but as I said, he's being, being coached by, by, a, by a very good friend of mine. Um, so I just want to a little bit through that. Um, I think one of his strengths, and I'll have to look at his games from this tournament, is that he just doesn't make big mistakes. And uh, sometimes not making mistakes is enough. And it really was in this tournament. And I think this is an important thing for some people who feel that they are not truly inspired players. Um, I, for example, have huge respect for the abilities of, of someone like Paolo Eliano. Um, but he doesn't have that many you know, cla um, classic masterpieces. Uh, under his belt. He wins a lot of fine games because he plays well consistently. I mean, consistency means a lot. So, okay, so here the game goes a bit further and, and White sort of gets into a bit of a, a muddle in a moment. Uh, knight c4, yeah, the knight's not very well placed. I was better placed on b3. We'll see why in a moment. Uh, here, here should exchange bishops. And here the knight is just not well placed, and there's a pawn going. And, and black could have uh, could have played for an advantage here. I probably did play for an advantage, but uh, wasn't successful. Rook d4 was stronger, probably. Around here, white manages to create some counterplay. Black has a draw in hand if he wants it, doesn't. And uh, white manages to create some counterplay and. You know, it's uh, just keep on playing. And then here he's, uh, the, you know, if you just go back a moment. And here, uh, you know, white has compensation for the pawn. Mm -hmm. He's going to make a draw. And then instead black plays king g8, which is very helpful. So here consistency beats inconsistency. Black generally had a better position and uh, probably did more interesting things in the game but he was very consistent and he won the game and that uh, you know, white was very consistent and won the game because of it um and that's together with two other wins uh, against other players where they around 2400 and uh, not losing to strong players is enough for gmo and uh, I know that a lot of people would like some of them. Okay, and um, the next thing I looked at was uh, the World Under-12 Boys Championship. And uh, the main reason I looked at that was because I thought there were some really interesting names in there. Uh, one of them is Jonas Bier, which is a Danish player. Um, he generally did very well. I think he was on board one at some point. He's uh, rated just below 2400. He's probably like third or, so, or second or third highest rated for the tournament. Uh, at some point, he was the highest rated uh, player in the world in his age range. 
I think that's partly because some players don't have the same access to tournaments. Uh, but he's certainly very strong. He's uh, just around 23, 70 or something at the moment. Um, and he's got a long time to develop. Um, you know, we, we should never overestimate the results of these uh, championships. We have to remember that uh, Carlsen played them and didn't win. And uh, very, very soon after that, he was, they had a winning position against Kafarov and beat Karpov and stuff like that. So uh, we should not overestimate them. And uh, generally, I didn't think the, the level of play was that impressive. Uh, from a lot of the guys, but uh, they were certainly fighting very hard. And uh, there's, there's, there's stars of the future there. Um, they have great, great potential, and um, I'm sure they'll get there. But uh, learning to understand chess and putting your pieces well will take a very long time. Um, in, in the end, uh, it was uh, the big uh, favorite. I'm looking at my card because I cannot pronounce this. Pragnananda from India, who's an IM and 2400, uh, 2442, I think it is. Uh, he was leading for a while and beat Jonas uh, as well on board one. And But in the end, there was just something missing in his game. And uh, the winner was an American from Florida of the name of Nikhil Kumar, uh, which again is a very Indian sounding name. Uh, so we had this block uh, uh, poll recently on our, on our side where uh, people were voting which would be the country dominating chess in 10 years. And uh, two of the, the countries doing well in that poll was uh, India and the US. Well, I think China's chances are overrated. I think these are the two countries and the US among others because they have a lot of immigrants, Chinese and Indian immigrants who play very well. Yeah, and, and also and second place was Andrew Hong. I don't know what his origin is, but you could think that he was Asian as well. Uh, now in the U.S. there are a lot of great coaches as well. Uh, I think uh, this young kid is trained by Boris Havruk, right? Uh, yeah, I think he's uh, he's definitely trained by Boris Havruk. I think he, he, what I've heard also or read on the Danish Federation website is that uh, Danish uh, uh, grandmaster Lars Paul Hansen, who lives in Florida, has lived there for a decade. Uh, also trains this kid, so um, uh -huh. I, I think uh, he, I think he made like four point over expected score, uh, four and a half maybe. Is that that's 180 rating points he won? Yes, his uh, his rating was uh, really low, but but you cannot really know the real strength of, of these players, right? No, 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 there was a, I think there was an eighteen hundred who played really well as well. Mm -hmm. um, so some some of them have access to tournaments and some of them don't. And okay, you're, you're always wondering when an American comes and makes it to the talks. By the way, I should say that uh, in these days, we also feel very compelled to just check some of the games compared to engines. And uh, I thought that I saw nothing suspicious at all. Um, uh, actually, I saw them playing entirely differently from how an engine would, would deal with things. And I like that um, because, you know, I'm. I'm a cynic these days. If you see some rated 2000 winning against the, everyone else, uh, you're thinking, what's, what's, what's happening here? And you look at the games, and he was just very solid. Uh, and I don't think he was very impressive as such, but he was 12. He was very consistent, and that is very important. Uh, but the games didn't look in themselves very impressive. Um, we can go forward here, uh, maybe like to move 11. Um, just before black place, you know what? So yeah, you were saying maybe sometimes keep the queen on, on D1? Uh, yes, the, uh, here, the, if white wants to play how he did in the game, uh, the best move is to play directly the knight to D2, because the queen might be good on C2, might go to D2, this is how, for example, uh, some big names like Giri are playing the position today. Um, it's, it's, uh, because uh, what White did in this game, he played uh, the knight to e2 and played then f3 and e4. And in, mm -hmm. the, in this kind of position, maybe the queen is better on d2 because it covers the e3 square. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and also has potential to go to the queen side in other ways. Yes, yes. Uh, but but uh, if black 
plays as he did in the game, the, the queen is better on c2. So it is a matter of uh, flexibility, actually. Yeah, the, the, okay, so let, let's move a few moves forward here. Just to show you what I, I thought was like an interesting moment here, here, and knight e2. And here, yeah, so knight f6, go, go back, to, take it back and put it on h5. So in, the, in this possession here, um, I don't think black's very theoretical. Um, but if you sort of understand what you want to do in this position, then uh, often the knight goes back to f6 because it has to. I think the knight often goes to b6, uh, so you can castle queenside quickly. Um, I personally like the idea of g6 here. My big dream, this is, I know this is probably never going to happen, but it's my big dream, is to play knight g7 and bishop f5. If I can then exchange and put my knight to d6, then I have a really great position. Um, especially if white comes with b4, because then I have a, an outpost on c4 for my knight. And I think that's the kind of thing you get with experience, and you don't just don't have much experience when you're 12. Uh, you know, Jakob, also what happens many times is that those young kids forget small details. For example, uh, in this position, actually, if we go yeah. a bit back, Sometimes h6 is uh, is inserted, and mm -hmm. uh, if if you play first h6, and the bishop goes back, and then you play here, now you can simply castle up a bishop to b3. But uh, mm -hmm. in the game you cannot do it because h7 hangs. So what mm -hmm. what what probably happened is that now Black simply wanted to castle, and he saw that he cannot do it, so he played uh, knight f6 back. Yeah, white plays ninety two first, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, I know this from uh, one of my students that uh, uh, really wants to play the Bengal Gambit in its game, but sometimes uh, she forgets to play b five, and and she never does this, uh, even if she can do it next time. You know, uh, if you don't play mm -hmm. b five at once, you, you can you can always play it later. So. What happens uh, many times is that uh, young kings do not understand um, small details like that, and they forget small details in the opening. Well, I think b5 in the, in the Benko Gambit is not a small detail. But... Yeah, of course, of course. Um... <laughs> but yeah, no, I get your point. Um, no, no, we, but we all forget stuff. Uh, and the thing is, the more often we have seen things, uh, we push the, the, the place where we forget stuff into the horizon. Uh, nobody remembers everything. So, okay, let, let's see uh, knight e2, knight f6, and castles. And then uh, here again, we have a position. And here we have a, a situation of, of, of uh, what I really felt was a problem with uh, the games of most of these young players, which was also some of the other games I noticed. Um, that this point in the game is where they're weakest, the moment when they have to organize their pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, White did very well here, but he probably just followed his uh, his preparation. Uh, I know Avrok is a is a really good coach for the openings, and uh, and he will have uh, worked with him very very well. By the way, we should say that Avrok is uh, a gun for hire, and uh, people should absolutely look him up and uh, and get lessons from him. Um, you can find him on Facebook. For example, it's a place to find anyone. But, um, but but here, Black has to try to organize his pieces, and over the next few moves, he really does badly. Even though he's uh, you know rated almost as much as me, this would be the part of the game where I would be very happy to play with him. But I think if everything's hanging, he could probably outcalculate me quite easily. Um, so so Black here should probably. Uh, castle, play with e8, and then knight f8, and he would have a quite an unpleasant version of, of this opening. But still, with the queen on c2, then f3, e4 is not so easy to organize. So, you know, okay, whites are better, but how, how much better would you think he is? I think he is much better. I think in this variation, you have to have h6 played in order to castle. Otherwise, white will play the knight to f4 actually, and play f3, e4. 
So you yeah, need your night one and another four and f three. Yeah, so you really yeah. need your knight to h five so that to discard why to play knight to a four. So white usually uh, he plays the rook from a one to e one and plays knight to c one and tries to play it to e four. But the knight on c one is, is not great. So I think uh, white here is actually comfort comfortably better. So yeah, um, no, but but still you, you yeah. have to play the rules for black, and, and I think developing your pieces is the right. But we see here now how the, the black spends a lot of time with the, the knight around, and uh, white just plays normal moves. A three prepare and B four at some point, and now on an e3 and hang, so white goes up three in a moment. But the rook, I don't think rook b1 is a great move, but it works out great in game. So here black, if you just go back a moment, here black really has, you know, knight on e6. It's really just in the way. And uh, and so he tries to make sense of, uh, of it by playing c5. And then that's just a horrible move. If we look at the white pieces, they're all ready. Black pieces, the whole back rank is uh, is inactive. So having some kind of confrontation at this point, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, it's not a surprise that white has a, has something strong. Um, but you know, even uh, okay, c5 takes queen takes, and just wait for a moment. Takes takes, and here even you know we're not going to put it on the board. Uh, even here, queen d2. Uh, and and then followed by knight d5. No, no, don't put it on the board. Uh, queen d2 uh, followed by, by knight b5. And white's just better. Um, and the knight goes to b4, and, and everything's great. But uh, people should, should maybe stop the, uh, the block for just a moment and then decide what they want to play. So there is a combination, you say? No, I didn't say that, but you said that. If I had wanted to say that, I would have said it. <laughs> okay. But okay, there is a combination, and uh, you should have stopped it already. So now let's just show the combination. So it's, it's not so difficult, really, but it's, it's very nice. So knight d5. So the rook indirectly from d1 is now very well placed. And I think that is luck. You cannot predict such things. So we take and we can't be taken. And it's just two pawns up. Yeah, and white one each way. So, uh, so that was the main things I had chess wise. I just also looked uh, a little bit at uh, the rating list, the uh, twenty seven hundred uh, chess dot com. Yeah, we should say that uh, Lars Schendorf in his book playing one d four mentions. Uh, uh, this variation, and if you're interested in it, you can read more about it there. And I think uh, next week probably we'll make the graphics a little better on, yeah. on, the, on the page. But we're learning, we're learning. Hopefully the sound is better than last week. But I just looked at uh, the rating list and see if there was anything interesting. I saw Kawana was up to 28, 23.4, having won 10.4 in Isle of Man. Um, what I most noticed was, uh, was that uh, Pavel Vianov uh, who's, who's also a friend, uh, had won the tournament, and I was very happy about that. But Karana is really back in being number two in the world very clearly, uh, except that uh, someone else is uh, enjoying the, the fruits of being number two in the world very soon. Um, we had a quiz on our website, www.qualitychess.co.uk. Go to the blog, and you'll find it there, World Championship Quiz. And uh, if you answer the questions correctly, predict the future, you have a chance to win a box of books sent to your address wherever in the world they will be. Another thing from the local, from the rating list, two players under 2,700, Peter Leko and Taimur Rajabo. What can you do? Yeah, well, uh, it's not my fault. Okay, that's what I had. Let's see what you have. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, big news was, uh, of course, a big tournament was the Russian Championships, uh, won by Razgantsev. 
uh, I would say that uh, everyone who wants to play the Karokan with Black, uh, currently Radjansev is the leading uh, theoretical expert on the Karokan. He plays some amazing ideas there. So there is plenty of material for you if you simply study his games. But um, um, an interesting thing I saw, because I always watch out for E4, E5 games, is that the following idea played by the young player called um, Oporin, he played against Fedoshev, I think it was the last round of the tournament, uh, when this Berlin uh, was, was seen on the board. And I know many people ask me what to do against the Berlin. And uh, it, it, it is really not a pleasant task for right to prepare, but there's this little idea. I have to say nobody asked me because they know I don't know anything. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's this little idea played by White in this game. Uh, he plays Queen E2. Uh, not a new idea. But, uh, Carlson played it against So, for example, in the Bilbao Open. Uh, mm -hmm. When So played uh, Bishop G4. Uh, no, sorry. Um, so played the Queen E7, and uh, the game continued like that. And now A3 followed by B4. Very complicated game. Carlson won. Uh, but later, Carlson said that he shouldn't have played h3, he should have waited for a moment. But the idea in this game shows another way to play for white. And um, something similar was played knight to d7. Of course, there are many, many moves here, but what um, Operin did here, he played bishop e3. And I like this setup very much. The idea is that white is going to play knight bd2 next, and he will see how he will continue. And uh, in this game, he, so he's keeping his options open. He, on which he's side keeping, to yes. And uh, my point is that if Black plays Queen E7 or Bishop G4, you can play Bishop E3, Knight B2, and uh, go from there. What happened is in this um, in this game is that um, Fedoshev played a typical chess, and now D4 came, and now uh, White has has a great position, and he created a very big attack. And he, go, he won the game uh, very, very convincingly and very easily. And uh, White is winning already, and you can check the you can check the details uh, at your home. But what I say is that Queen E2 followed by Bishop E3 might be a very interesting and simple way for White to play against the Berlin. At least it's worth a game. Yeah? Yeah. So what, what, is, what is your guess? How many Berlins will we see in the World Championship? I'm not sure. Uh, I have no idea. I think that most probably uh, Karyakin will prepare some sharp stuff. This is my prediction. Because he really... I think we'll see the in-game this frequently. Yeah. I don't think we'll see it. This is also my... Uh, my way of thinking. We will see. It will be very interesting. Okay, so uh, if you go to our website, uh, go to the blog, you will find somewhere that this blog is, and we'll find a link to the PGM file. And we'll set up very soon uh, uh, a, a fixed link for, uh, for download for the PGM. We also have on our website on the front, uh, over in the left column somewhere, we have a PGN file with updates to various books and whatever we, we ever put online. Um, who knows if we'll put the blog in there or we'll put it somewhere else. We'll, we'll see in the future. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye. Okay.